All right. Hey guys, happy Tuesday. Um, so we today are going to be jumping in. I want to make sure, okay, everything is set. Good. We're going to be jumping in back to the book of, um, Genesis again today, following the Tower of Babel story. And we're going to pick up with the next major Bible story that happens. And we will be introduced to a character named Abram today, who you probably know as Abraham. And we are going to look at where he came from and then um, kind of take a closer look at the significance of God changing his name um, and the promise, the covenant that he makes with him. So that is where we're going. Um, I made a mistake yesterday. I thought that this week was a short week, but guess what? It's next week. We have five days of school this week. So I thought that gave us enough time to learn a new memory verse. I'm hoping you all memorized the other one and had a great time practicing it yesterday. Um, but we're going to learn a new one. So I'm wondering if anyone would like to volunteer to read it for us. You can raise your hand and we will call on you. We can pause and let you read. All right, great job reading. So I think this is a really important verse. Um, it reminds us of some important things and I'm curious what you think it reminds us of. So what stands out to you from that verse? I would love for you to choose one or two words. So this is, remember we did soap, we read the scripture, now we're observing and we're making an application. So what does it mean for our lives? I'm gonna put the verse back up and I'm gonna give you guys a moment to pause and either post in the group chat or take some volunteers to let us know what jumps out when you hear these words. I'll read it one more time before we pause. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So think, let's pause. What stands out to you and what does this mean? All right, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. I think that this is a really powerful verse. So I'm putting it going back and forth. Um, that reminds us about the importance of hiding God's word in our heart, that it keeps us living right. It keeps us making the right choice um, so that we don't sin against God. So cool stuff. We're going to practice this one all week. Would anyone like to pray before we jump in with our story? We can go ahead and pause and take a volunteer here. Great. Thank you for praying. So question, you can do this in the group chat or take a couple of volunteers. What do you guys dream your future will look like? You could say an example of a career or where you'll be living, what will your family look like? Give us in like one sentence, what do you dream your future will look like? Let's pause and take a moment to respond. Okay, so we are going to be talking about Abraham today, like I told you, although his name was originally Abram, and he becomes the father of many nations. However, his future <clears throat> was promised to him by God. And it was a hard one for him to envision, and we'll kind of look at why. So quick question, show of hands. Um, you can start a poll and do this, or we can raise our hands. But I'm curious, how many of you have heard of Abraham before? Okay, I'm going to guess that a couple of us probably have. Um, I did tell his story about him almost sacrificing his son Isaac back at the beginning of the quarter. Um, but we're going to analyze it a little bit more completely and a little bit more broadly. But before we do, I'm going to show you a video. This actually kind of explains a little bit um, what happened after Babel. So if we remember yesterday, we looked at the Tower of Babel and we saw God scatter all these nations. And so what we see happen after, and we have archaeological records of this, is that civilization started to spring up, according to the video, seemingly overnight. Um, all these civilizations start to develop, and you get all these different city-states, and economies start to flourish, and then you have, like, kings and rulers, and then empires start to form. And right after the start of this, so as these civilizations are taking off, we meet Abraham. And it's important to know what 
was going on in the world around him, that people were developing writing. This is where cuneiform came about, um, that laws were starting to be developed. This was a very civilized time period. And so it's important to know that. And so while we're watching this video, we're going to see a couple of cities pop up. Be looking for a city called Ur. That is going to be significant. So let's watch. The story of writing, astronomy, and law. The story of civilization itself begins in one place. Not Egypt, not Greece, not Rome, but Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4000 and 3100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. Despite near-constant warfare, innovation and development thrived in ancient Mesopotamia. They built on a monumental scale, from palaces, to ziggurats, mammoth temples served as ritual locations to commune with the gods. They also developed advanced mathematics, including a base 60 system that created a 60 second minute, a 60 minute hour, and a 360 degree circular angle. The Babylonians used their sophisticated system of mathematics to map and study the sky. They divided one earth year into 12 periods, each was named after the most prominent constellations in the heavens, a tradition later adopted by the Greeks to create the zodiac. They also divided the week into seven days, naming each after their seven gods embodied by the seven observable planets in the sky. But perhaps the most impactful innovation to come out of Mesopotamia is literacy. What began as simple pictures scrawled onto wet clay to keep track of goods and wealth developed into a sophisticated writing system by the year 3200 BC. This writing system would come to be called cuneiform in modern times and proved so flexible that over the span of 3000 years, it would be adapted for over a dozen different major languages and countless uses including recording the law of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, which formed the basis of a standardized justice system. But Mesopotamia's success became its undoing. Babylon in particular proved too rich a state to resist outside envy. In 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon and sealed his control over the entirety of Mesopotamia. For centuries, this area became a territory of foreign empires. Eventually, Mesopotamia would fade, like its kings, into the mist of history, and its cities would sink beneath the sands of Iraq. But its ideas would prevail in literacy, law, math, astronomy, and the gift of civilization itself. All right, so... <clears throat> The reason I wanted you to see this is because it takes place and kind of sets the stage for Abraham's arrival, but it also kind of gives you an idea of the backdrop of the rest of the Old Testament narrative. So all this stuff happens. Mesopotamia is a thriving civilization for a couple thousand years. Um, I think four to five thousand ish. And Abraham doesn't come on the scene until 2000 years BC. So kind of almost in the middle of it. And then where this video ended with Babylon, around 600 BC, that's when Babylon actually comes into Israel's story during the time of Daniel, if you guys remember Daniel in the lion's den. And then 
Babylon ends up falling to Cyrus the Great and a bunch of stuff happens that actually ends up setting the stage quite perfectly for Jesus's arrival. Um, but that's kind of a conversation for another day. So looking though at Abraham, when he shows up on the scene, civilization is booming. There's writing, there's an economy. And so um, we're actually going to play this in a second. I think I'm going to skip it for now because I want to point out what happens with Abraham. So Abraham is actually the son of a man named Tara, and he has a couple brothers, and they live pretty wealthily, like they have a lot of money, um, because Tara was a tradesman. Um, we believe that he probably traded in gold and spices, and Abraham was Abram, actually at this point in the story, was born in the city of Ur to Tara. Um, but sometime during Abram's life, there start to be a couple wars and it gets a little unsettled in that area. So they end up moving to a city called Haran. And it's there that Tara, Abram's dad, dies of old age and natural causes. But Abraham being the oldest ends up taking over all of his father's wealth. He inherits everything. And so Abram is living a pretty comfortable life. But one night, we believe he's probably sitting out in the middle of the country. He's watching his dad's sheep kind of on the edge of town, probably most likely. And if you guys can imagine the clearest night sky that you've ever seen with stars so bright that they look so numerous. Um, imagine it was a night like that when all of a sudden God spoke to Abram and he gave him this command. He said, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. There is something very significant that I want us to catch here. God told Abram to go. And he makes a promise to him. But a little bit of context is important too. When God told Abram to leave Haran, he was telling him to leave civilization and go to a land that he would show him. Well, that land was Canaan, which is modern day Israel. And at the time of Abraham's life, Canaan was kind of on the edge of Mesopotamia and it was made up of a whole bunch of tribes and they were pretty barbaric. And it was not very safe. So Abram was giving up guaranteed wealth with all his business contacts that his dad had established and being asked to go somewhere kind of scary. But we don't see Abram question. We see him go. And this is going to be a common theme. Abram listens to God. And I think, so Abram was actually born in a polytheistic society. The people at that time, we even caught in the video, they worshiped creation instead of the creator. And they believed in a lot of gods. And Abram probably did too until he met God. Because our God, the God of the Bible, he speaks. None of the gods that the people of Mesopotamia worshipped were able to speak and communicate. And so when God spoke to Abram, Abram listened and he perked up because he could recognize and see that this God was real. And so Abram goes and we can kind of see in a map. So that arrow is pointing to Ur where he was born. And Haran is all the way up that in that brown box at the top, right above the Mari kingdom. And then you see in red in that great sea area, the land of Canaan. So this is quite a journey. And if you guys remember when we looked at um, Google Maps and we saw what kind of land this was, I hope you remember. Maybe pause and think if you can remember. It was desert. It is desert. This is a really dry area. And so this was a hard journey. But we don't see Abram, we don't see him say no. We see him say yes. So he takes his wife, Sarai, that is her name at this point, and his nephew, Lot. And they have a lot of adventures along the way. Um, Abram is promised a son by God. And at this point in the story, Abram is pretty old and he doesn't have any kids. He actually, his next in line is one of his brother's sons who's back in Haran. Um, and that would be his heir. And so when God first promises Abram that he's going to have a son, Sarai 
thinks that she's too old and she doesn't believe that it's possible that God means, means her. And so she actually gives Abram her maidservant Hagar to take as a wife or Hagar to take as a wife. And Abram goes along with her plan, even though it's not what God said. And he has a son with Hagar and this son is named Ishmael. However, after this, God comes back and he reaffirms his covenant with Abram and says, no, 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 no. You are operating outside of what I intended. I meant what I said. Sarai is the one with whom you will have the promised son. And Sarai actually overhears this conversation because God sends him a couple angels to tell him again. And she actually laughs about it. But a year later, it comes to pass when she's like in her 80s and Abraham's in his seven or 90s. So this is like a span of almost 20 plus years that this takes place. And Sarah in her old age has a son and they name him Isaac, which means laughter. And if you've ever heard of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that happens during this time period too. Um, Lot ends up being spared dramatically after some angels come and tell him to get out of the city because it becomes so evil that God has to destroy it and crazy stuff. Um, I highly encourage you to read through the end of Genesis. Abraham's family goes through a lot. There is even a couple times where Abraham, Abram at this point, so, um, he is traveling, he travels to Egypt for one um, brief season because there's famine. And Sarai is so beautiful that Abram is afraid that Pharaoh is going to try and take her. So he lies and says that she's his sister. And It does not go well for the Egyptians because then they take her into the palace and they end up becoming punished by God. And then Abraham basically gets paid to leave. It's this whole epic story. So highly, highly encourage you pick up the Bible, read through Genesis 15 through like 20 plus all these chapters. They're really good. So um, we also see in the middle of this, that story where God tests Abraham's faith again And he tells him to take Isaac up to the mountain and sacrifice him. But if you guys remember the story, you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Does Abraham, or Abraham, because his name gets changed, we'll look at that in a second. Does he actually sacrifice Isaac? No, he doesn't. But this is foreshadowing because God is going to someday sacrifice his son for the world. And so there's a lot of foreshadowing in this story, all pointing to Christ and Ultimately, when God said to Abraham that he was going to bless all nations of the earth through him, he was referring to Christ then too. So pretty cool stuff. So before we kind of wrap up here, I am going to highlight for you real quickly why the name change matters. So remember that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And on the left, we see Abram's original name. When God calls him, this is his name. But then God eventually changes Abraham's or Abram's name to Abraham as a symbol of his covenant with him and of the promise that he is giving him. And he changes his name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude of nations. And he is called out of comfort and asked to leave it behind, to leave a local perspective to an international one. And if you notice... This little tiny character is the only letter that is different. And that letter is significant because it is part of God's name. God shares part of his identity with Abram in making this connection, this covenant, this relationship, this agreement. And because of Abraham's yes, the whole world gets blessed eventually through Christ. And we're kind of running out of time. So we don't have a lot of time to go over this, but it is significant to know that Abraham's family today, Isaac's descendants go on to become the nation of Israel. They are the Jewish people, the Hebrews, and they are the ones that we are going to be following through the Old Testament. It's their story that we'll follow. Um, In the rest of the Old Testament, it is about them. And the New Testament kind of picks up. Christ is born out of Isaac's lineage. Um, But Ishmael's family goes on to become a great nation as well. And they make up part, some argue all or very little of, because um, it gets a little kind of hard to keep track. Uh, the Bible stops following Ishmael's story. And so there are other records and tribal records and genealogies that we can kind of look out outside of the Bible. But those people largely become known as Arabs. <clears throat> and so <sighs> Islam kind of grows out of Ishmael's descendants. And they become a religion that worships Allah, 
who they claim is the same God of Abraham. So we have Islam and Judaism that all claim roots with Abraham. But um, when we read in the, in the Bible, God told Abraham very clearly that um, Isaac was the promised son, the one who the covenant would, would become or would be born from. However, he does bless Ishmael and Ishmael, like we saw, became a great nation. There's just a debate now. And so it's interesting to see how Abraham's descendants um, or his decisions really to have a son with Hagar and to step outside of God's original plan, how it still has consequences today. A lot of people even point to the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis today as kind of being part of that. Um, it's a pretty com complicated situation. But interesting, because we still see evidence of it today. So I'm going to pause there. We're going to save that second video that I had for another time, because I am a little afraid that we're running out of time. If there is still time, you guys can take a moment to kind of reflect and think about why God chose Abraham and how his um, <clears throat> willingness was shown. What did Abraham do to obey God? And then <clears throat> Abraham was not, sorry, I my throat. Aram is not a perfect guy, and we're going to see this theme that God uses imperfect people to bring about his perfect plans, and I'm curious how that makes you feel. And then a couple times I mentioned that Jesus is in the story. Did you guys catch how? How do we see it? So take a moment to respond. You can either discuss it, or if there's time, you can do it in Schoology, um, but I know this was a lot of information, so I hope it was interesting. We'll keep talking more about Abraham's family in the next few days. Have a good afternoon, guys. Bye.